this is, this is who I am, this is who we are, uh, a blasted church, unpretentious, really easygoing, and um, it was an exercise in, of course, starting a business, but also being very creative and different. Uh, and, and I want to start off by saying that um, I looked at, at the title where it said uh, Entrepreneur Story, and way back, just before we started um, to look at this idea of, of buying a winery or starting a business, I was already 40 plus, and I remember my father-in-law saying to me, why do you want to leave the city and leave your jobs? It's a comfortable uh, lifestyle, and you know you can just work your way into retirement, and it's all, you know, don't don't uh, don't make any waves, and and you'll be fine into retirement. And I went, oh my God, and I felt like I, I pushed myself over the edge, and I needed to get out of that type of thinking, and I was even more determined to to start my our own business and uh, thanks to my father-in-law I worked really hard to to get to where we are now and may not have done that um, had it not been for that so um, I'll start off by explaining what we did uh, 14 years ago I guess no even a little bit earlier than that my husband and I went to Napa, Napa Valley on a that was our 14th anniversary, that was, that's what it was, to, um, to do a little bit of wine tasting and check out what the wine regions were like. That's not unusual. Lots of people like to do that. It's a wonderful experience uh, looking at what the lifestyle is of uh, what people do down in, in Napa and other wine growing regions of, uh, of the world. And man, was it ever exciting and romantic and we thought, isn't that an interesting thing to do? But we all do that. We all dream of those kinds of things, don't we? But uh, it stayed with us a little bit longer, um, the idea. But, you know, we got back, to, back home, back to reality, back to our jobs in Vancouver, back to our desk jobs, um, raising the kids and uh, just doing what we normally did. We, our activities um, were boating. So we had a sailboat on the coast and enjoyed those things, but you know, nothing to do with wine. We weren't really that well versed in, in wines at all. But um, it kind of still stuck with us and we started to do a little bit of research and tasting. We realized that there was a wine growing region right here in BC and there were some new stores that were already opening, uh, VQA stores that uh, we started to visit more often and uh, taste all different wines. Um, and then lo and behold, one day Chris picked up the paper and saw an ad, just a little tiny ad that said winery for sale in the Okanagan and just a fax number. Well, <laughs> well. <laughs> so we, sent off a message to the fax faxes. I mean, that was all there was at that time. <laughs> no emails yet, I don't think. I'm not quite sure. It might have just been the beginning. And no response. Well, we kept on trying. Kept on phone sending a message to that fax number. And lo and behold, in the end, we got a message back from a realtor that said, well, you seem to be very determined. And uh, we get, I get um, inquiries daily, but I can't answer them all. And certainly, you know, people kind of leave it, let it go to the wayside. But you guys seem pretty determined. So um, we were, we told them, we explained that we were, and we wanted to uh, see what it was what it was all about. Sorry, I went a little bit too fast here. So not really knowing much about the Okanagan, we decided to go on a weekend trip and uh, check it all out. So Penticton, that was where we were headed. Um, pretty low key, not like the city. And uh, but we drove up and down there, I'm at a bench and it was delightful with all the vineyards and orchards and you know, we were also not just looking at it as a scenic um, experience, but, you know, thinking about buying a business and moving. And uh, it was, you know, pretty, pretty country-ish, 
not ever living in the country. I was born and raised in Montreal, and uh, that was all I ever knew. Um, but we thought it was a lovely idea, and it was just probably the right thing to do for us. Um, well, we, as a couple of accountants, went home after looking at the property, after getting some information, and um, put a business plan together. So we did a lot of research, and at that time there was an association called the BCWI, still is, sorry, BCWI, uh, Winery Institute, and they had put out a lot of information on the industry. Um, the um, wine, uh, sorry, um, BC Liquor Distribution branch also had lots of data as far as what the new um, region was doing as far as sales. So we put all those things together, came up with um, some financing, we took it to the bank, they thought it looked okay. Um, we decided to put um, an offer together, presented it, and we were negotiating um, buying the property. But in the very last minute, it didn't quite work out for us. And we didn't follow through on the purchase. Um, it, it was starting to become known, it was started to become, um, we were sort of at the early stages of when the industry and the Okanagan Valley was recognized for the wineries. And there was a bit of interest going on. So the places that were for sale, they put a price on it and then they saw that, oh, well, maybe we can raise the price a little bit more. And you know, there was a time when you had to say no and step back. So that's what happened. But we still had a relationship with the realtor, and I mean, he invested a lot of time in the project, and so did we. So he showed us some more places to look at. And again, we changed the name on the business plan to the new property that we were looking at, did all the research again, and again, it came down to the 11th hour, wasn't gonna happen. But again, this is after two, Two years, the kids of course were horrified at the beginning when we made up this plan of going out to the Okanagan. And um, by two years later, they thought, mom and dad are never gonna do this. We're safe, we're not going anywhere. Well, one more time, the realtor took us down to this not so beautiful looking property in the south, south of Penticton on the Okanagan, uh, Skaha Lake. Um, on East Side Road across from Caledon. This was for sale for about half a year or even longer, and nobody looked at it. There, as you can see close to the water, were new structures built of a new winery, but nobody came to visit. And uh, it was a huge property compared to what we were looking at previously. Uh, 20 acres was, you know, easy to manage for a small mom paw operation. This was 70 acres and 42 acres of planted vineyard. But we had done our homework. We knew the potential. So on our visit, this is also what we saw. A new property, but old, old equipment and they were doing a little bit of winemaking at the time with stuff that you wouldn't ever want to see. And um, that's why nobody was looking at this place. This was also their front uh, entrance um, over top beside the parking lot. We asked them what this was. They said, well, it's just a water reservoir that we needed to build when we put the buildings in, in case of fire. And this is what, kind of what you looked at when you were approached this, this property. But we did it. <laughs> we pulled up our stakes and we moved to the Okanagan. Uh, the kids couldn't believe it. They were at that time in grade 11 and 12, 
They said, you can't do this to us. And he said, it's not about you, it's about me. <laughs> um, in my background, where I grew up in Montreal, I had spent uh, some time actually um, after high school or even a little bit in between high school, and I went to, to my, where my parents were from in, in Austria to do some schooling. And I said, you know what? You don't have to just do what everybody else does. You'll look back on this opportunity when you, we pulled you out of school and brought you out somewhere else, and uh, you'll look at it back at it in fond memories to uh, experience something that none of your friends got to do. So we're all going out here together. Um, then we had a new property. So if we build it, will they come? We had a lot of work to do, as you can see from the other pictures. And, uh, but what we realized, it was a diamond in the rough. And when we opened our doors, um, the f months later at the first uh, May 1st when we took over the property and shortly after that for the summer season. People and industry, other winery um, representatives would come by and went, oh my gosh, we didn't know that this property was for sale. And, but it was, and everybody had the opportunity to take a look at it, but we felt really proud that we had scooped it up because we thought we had something going on really special. And this was the winery. Purpage Hills was the name of the winery, named after Dan Purpage, the owner of the property. Dan was Croatian, and uh, hence the lack of vowels in the P-R-P-I-C-H. Um, and as you can see, he copied the well-known famous winery of Grkic Hills in, in Napa Valley. Um, he thought this was the way to, to brand his winery. His young winemaker said, well, I'm not quite sure well, if they'll really like it, but sure enough, um, uh, they uh, made an inquiry and, and phoned them up and said, this is what we want to do. And they said, eh, no problem, go ahead. You know, countrymen, um, we really like that you're starting out in the, in the, in the same uh, path as we are. And they didn't really consider Dan to be a threat to their, to their brand. So that's what they did. Now, I'm sure, almost 99.9% .9 sure that nobody had ever heard of Purpage Hills, even if they knew of any BC wineries going back that long ago. And, um, but they had produced a couple of hundred cases for a few years, and, um, but fortunately for us, it was a really exciting time because the other two um, examples, the other two wineries where we did uh, put in an offer to purchase, they were already well established and we just would have picked up, um, including, you know, paying some goodwill and whatever, picked up their brand and carried on. But this was exciting. This was something that I could sink my teeth into. Not that I really knew anything, but um, it was going to be a, a fun experience. You know, there's one great thing about what we had done way back when is that if we had really any idea or any education background about starting a business, I'm sure we probably would have had uh, no, we wouldn't have stepped into the challenge that we took on because um, in hindsight it was really difficult. But as we did go forward, everything was sort of wide open to us and, and we had uh, lots to experience. Then um, my husband, uh, we sort of split up our tasks. Chris was more involved in the vineyard operations and the winery production and I decided to take on the accounting, the marketing, the administration and all that. At the time when we took over the property, I was still in Vancouver as the kids were um, finishing up their school year and Chris was already out in the Okanagan. So in between trying to juggle their school, still work full time downtown, um, I still wanted to find a way to do the branding and get started. Um, so of course there were you know, people, skilled people in Vancouver that I could probably still approach and, and have a, a, a chat with. But um, we didn't have a budget. 
no budget really at all to take on the uh, exercise of branding. Through a friend of a friend, I got in touch with um, a fellow that was really keen to get started with a new project, and that was Bernie Hadley Beauregard of Brand Ever. So we teamed up together and we were a great pair. I was an ideal client because I'm a risk taker and I will do jump at anything. And he felt as if he could get his creative juices into something and uh, we went uh, obviously very far together. And um, so there were a few things. We decided and I agreed that, you know, we'd do you know, anything different from what would normally and typically be done in marketing and branding. We also needed to come up with something that was just going to wow people and stop people dead in their tracks. Um, and one of the stipulations I had was that it couldn't be, you know, the typical winery um, branding, no geographical references, there were already too many hills, valleys, mountains, whatever in a name, so what's the point? We're never going to, you know, distinguish ourselves from anybody else. And then at that time, everything was very minimalistic, so to the point of little labels could be as small as postage stamps. That was kind of the style of things, so we decided, you know, let's, let's shake it up, let's do something else. Um, so we were able to start with a blank slate um, and um, it was you know wide open to us that whatever we wanted to do um, so we had all sorts of ideas as to you know uh, names names came out constantly with this work with that work um, and how would we make something different and un unique? We went, uh, we decided to stay within the area and maybe look at some story. I mean, a story, wouldn't the story be really good? So, you know, other than just something plain as, as a geographical reference, why don't we create something that had a meaning to it? So, you know, we started to look into some his history in the community. We went to the museums and the archives and to try to find something, you know, maybe some Indian folklore or something that had some kind of meaning in the, in the area. Um, it was, a, was, was an opportunity for us. And we found something. The Little Church in O.K. Falls, the United Church. In the archives of O.K. Falls, we found a story that was uh, written um, in a newspaper, a couple in a, celebrating an anniversary of the, of the Dynamite Church. And uh, we started reading the uh, description, and the story was of um, the church, where, which was moved from uh, a mining town called Fairview, 16 miles south and to the west of Oliver. Uh, and, um, there's a kiosk there now that actually tells the story of that mining town that was um, abandoned um, back in the 1930s, 29, 20s. Um, and the, um, some of the, the, the people from OK Falls needed a church, so they decided that this one church left behind from the mining town was going, they would like to, to move it to their community. So Harley Hatfield was an engineer um, that devised a plan to move it. And with the help of some of his, um, the townsfolk, they um, created a plan to put uh, some dynamite, four sticks in the rafters of the church. And they boarded up the windows, um, told there was a little school actually nearby because somebody actually told me that um, a couple of years ago and um, it was an elderly gentleman that said he was only knee-high to a grasshopper in the school. Um, when he, Harley had ca came into the building, and he remembers that they said, you know, to make sure the kids don't come out because we're going to uh, um, explode the church. And <laughs> sure enough, he remembers that story and, and, and uh, told it to me. Um, the plan was successful. They did lose the steeple, but they were able to save all the, the timbers and load it into trucks, bring it down to OK Falls. They put the um, building back together, put a new steeple on it, and uh, opened for uh, their first service a year later. 
So where we, we decided this was a great story. This was going to be fabulous. So then we, I said, well, you know, we still have, we had some bulk wine. This is sort of, a, you know, something as far as the wine, winery goes. Um, we bought the winery, we bought the building, we bought the property. There wasn't really much inventory. There was a little bit in some bottled wine with that label, Purpich Hills. And then there was bulk wine, which had, were still in tanks. And um, we had, that was our wine to sell. So we thought, well, what do we do with this bulk wine? It was a couple of hundred cases of wine. Well, we're gonna go for it. We're gonna bottle that wine in our new packaging and it was gonna happen right away. But uh, we also threw out the idea of the name Blasted Church to our friends and families. They said, you're crazy, you can't do that. But I'll, have, I'll say one thing in that you have to really stick to what you really wanna do. And it was everybody that said it's not a good idea. It's going to offend a lot of people and you're going to sink right away. It's not, going to, it's not going to go for you. You know, and nine people out of ten said it's not going to work. And the next day, the tenth person that came back said, yeah, I'm going to change my, my yes to a no. <laughs> but um, along the way, this was the first time or the first um, experience where I came to realize that if I was a small company, I can't compete with a lot of money, a lot of funds to throw into an ad agency that has a army of creative people and advertising to get something out there, a name and a brand to get yourself moving. The advantage that I had was that I could do what everybody told me that wouldn't work. When you have a bigger corporation or too many people being involved that have, you have to have a consensus, you probably could never do um, this exercise. So from that point on, I realized that I would take any opportunity, in, in a, obviously that would work, um, to go in a different path from what would typically work for a larger corporation and, and where, where there were more um, stakeholders than, than just myself and, and my husband so that um, we could really step away from the norm and, and do something different. And there's always that saying that you don't have to um, please everybody I mean even if you, even if it's contrary you know controversial um, that's good enough to get out there and get people talking about you which certainly was the case with the name blasted church the letter came from the congregation of um, and and the uh, um, of blasted church saying we really don't approve of you using this name. Um, we're very offended. We don't like what you're doing. And please remove this name and come up with another idea. Again, though, there were others. That was the, that was the letter that came. Then there were the other um, individuals from the congregation that would come to the door and say, yeah, but it's kind of fun. I mean, I, you know, I don't really agree with everything that they're saying. We tried to, <laughs> we tried though to um, explain that of, of, it's a lovely story. It's a story of their community. It's a story, I mean, of course, it's a great story for us and it's gonna sell wine, but it's a story for the community themselves and the rich history of, of um, their community and, and of the church. And it needn't, you needn't hide it. It's, it's a lovely story to embrace 
the, the history and, and richness of, of the history in the area. So we moved forward. Remember that minimalistic little idea of, of what should be on a, a label for a, a, a wine bottle? This is where we went instead. Again, going back to Napa Valley when Chris and I were down there tasting wines and learning everything, we wanted the same um, other people, like-minded people, well, a lot of us are, are, are not snobby wine drinkers, and we wanted people to uh, just enjoy wine and, and take the experience of just what it is and not having to be afraid of what they think that they should be tasting and, and how they relate to the wine. So this is the approach that we took. Monica Melnichuk was our artist at the time who developed um, our storytelling series. Uh, and it went through, um, we started with six labels and ended up with 13 to add to the story. Um, it starts off with this one where we plan, the, the, the folks of OK Falls plan the moving of the church from Fairview to OK Falls. And in the newspaper, you can see X and the little squiggly to the other X where they want to move it to. So in all of the labels, there's a part of the story. And we wanted people to you know, find things in there that they could relate to. Well, that looks like Uncle George, and you know, that's, and that happens all the time. Well, isn't that you, the lady there? And when they come into the wine shop. But no, it's just all creative magic. And uh, we loved every minute of it. And, and my poor husband, who's not like me at all, had to feel the, um, urge to run and hide under a rock when we told him that he had to call his winery Blasted Church and he would have to answer his cell phone saying, um, Chris from Blasted Church. But, uh, you know, it grew on us very quickly. So it was, um, it, uh, it just became part of us. Well, you know, the industry wasn't about to, um, to embrace our idea, and they really didn't know what to say. Um, they thought we, we had feedback that we'd never be able to sell a bottle of this wine with this label for more than eight bucks. You know, it's just not got the pedigree, it's not, it's, you know, it's just not going to, um, nobody would pay any more money for a bottle with that kind of image on it. Um, and that you couldn't put cartoons on a label. Um, and of course, then the VQA panel, the uh, Vintners um, Quality Assurance is what we submit our wines to. There was also the quality of the wines that we also want to wanted to achieve and um, we, have always been a part of the VQA from the very beginning, but they have to approve the, um, the wines for quality and uh, faults, but they also look at the label, and they weren't quite sure how it would pass, but as Harry McWaters, one of the founding members of um, the B, um, VQA, said that we're not about to change the rules just to keep these guys out. It is what it is. We don't have anything to exclude them, so live with it, guys, and uh, he, he was fabulous in that regard. And, you know, the wine critics in and around Vancouver, where we sold, sold most of our wine, and, and still do, um, were just delighted. They couldn't, they couldn't, they just laughed. They couldn't believe what was going on and uh, how we shook up all the, all the, uh, the industry as to, to the point where we decided that one label was going to have caricatures of some of the more, more popular guys. And that was a lot of fun because, you know, we pointed out what, you know, somebody that has gray hair actually had, you know, really young looking face and hair. And they goes, well, I feel really good on this label. Um, he looked 20 years younger than, than what he was. So uh, they, they really enjoyed that. Uh. And, uh, you know, and we put it out there and, People, uh, people just loved it. It was easy drinking, easy going, laughable, lots of fun. And that was really what we set out to achieve. 
But, you know, after being low-key about it, you know, let's just please the masses and let's just make something really enjoyable. You know, the Fairmont Hotels, they were the, one of the first uh, of our clients to, to, in, to embrace us. Um, not necessarily all the very serious sommeliers in the city, but uh, certainly some of them saw that um, it was quite an event, adventure and uh, they could see that um, they embraced us and, and uh, we were included in a lot of, uh, uh, and it really shows well, especially in the city where they can uh, show the accomplishments of our little region of uh, BC wine growers. So we, of course, um, included other things, obviously, in and around the, um, the labels. Um, but not, we did not do ever have ad, any print advertising, radio, TV, anything. All of our um, efforts and marketing and advertising go into our labels and our website. Um, and of course now social media as well. But uh, every couple of weeks we get um, media packages sent to us asking us if we would like to uh, advertise in magazines, but uh, we, we, we don't uh, do any and have still ma managed uh, our success with, with the word of mouth, which is, which is our labels. And um, what we th thought we were doing when we first started was we thought we were just um, part of a little niche. Um, we saw ourselves in just a little bit of a niche industry and a niche area where we were just a very small boutique winery. And it wasn't really um, the direction as far as um, growing and growing and, and making more and more uh, wine. We, we didn't have thoughts of competing with uh, on a global market or, or for that matter, even some of the bigger wineries in, in the Okanagan. It, we just didn't feel that we were um, competing with them because we were so small. So that's where this whole marketing plan was um, created and started, and that was good enough for us. And it, we were happy with the cult following that we had. It was, it was wonderful. That was all we really expected to do. Our vineyard is um, 40 acres, which produces 10,000 cases. And we were happy that that was where we were always going to be with our, our business. Um, but we quickly grew over and over um, the wine shop and then beyond that to the BC market, in particular Vancouver and Whistler. Um, and now um, quite a large volume goes to Alberta, a little bit into the LCBO in Ontario as far as the SAQ in Quebec as well. So we had to go and source grapes. So we have some fabulous um, grape growers that uh, are partners with us, including the Sloans next door to us at, uh, at the Matheson Creek Farm. And then a lot of wineries or another, uh, uh, other vineyards down in Oliver and Asuyas and up in Kelowna as well in the West Bank. Then again, as I was saying, not a lot of advertising, but certainly um, brand-centered events. We were um, pretty popular in the Fall Wine Festival with our, um, blast, our midnight service. We brought um, people, a gospel choir from Vancouver, um, emptied out the barrel hall, set up a stage, and had entertainment going with um, then uh, after the um, events that were held throughout the day in the evening time in Penticton, we bussed everybody out to the winery and had our event from 10 o'clock till midnight. We called it midnight service. Uh, also then, of course, by that time, everybody's starving to death. So we had Memphis Blues do a big um, buffet barbecue style um, uh, food service as well as wine for everybody and uh, great gospel music. And you know this is uh, where we um, 
kept on moving. The brand got plastered all over my car and people would wave at me all the time and made sure I had to drive carefully all the time, not get into too much trouble. Um, sadly, right at the very beginning, I mean, it wasn't, wasn't you know, nice roses and everything went uh, all throughout. At the very beginning, the first year, our first harvest, our winemaker, um, unfortunately, was um, died in a wine-related accident where he uh, and his um, friend passed away in a, in a, in a tank of wine. Um, and, of course, we were thrown into terror, um, not only because of the death of Frank, but certainly also because of our business. We didn't do the winemaking ourselves, um, or for that matter, we don't uh, um, work exclusively in the vineyard totally ourselves. We have quite a large staff because of the size and including the, the winery, and we didn't want any... Um, we always knew from the beginning we wanted to have a well um, a very good winemaker, um, and also one that would be uh, an employee of Blasted Church, even with the very early years when we were just uh, very small producers. We didn't want to go the consultant route because we didn't want our, you know, to be homogenized with a lot of other wineries with the same consultant. Um, so Frank worked for us, but um, unfortunately passed away at that harvest we were very lucky to have wineries and uh, owners and winemakers from up and down the valley to help us through our fermentation and get our wines to bottle and out to to sale to, to the retail and and restaurants and um, we were really uh, blessed by that and really happy that uh, everything worked out for us and then we motored on we just kept on finding other people so you know we went out in search of a new winemaker, and uh, then another winemaker, another winemaker. We had a succession of different winemakers, but you know things don't always go exactly the way you want, and you just go with the go with the flow and, and whatever happens to you. So, how do you make a million dollars in the wine business? You start with four. <laughs> I think everybody knows that little joke. Um, as you can see, the wine vineyard started to improve with lots of love and care um, from the first picture that you sh we showed you when poor Dan um, ran out of cash. I guess that was his biggest problem. He was a farmer. He was able to uh, grow grapes very well and sell them to other wine wineries. Um, saw the uh, um, success of wineries going from grapes to wine and wanted to um, have that, fulfill that dream for himself as well. And he put in the tasting room and, and winery, but the bank never told him that he actually needed more cash to build an inventory to sell the wine. And unfortunately, um, he was getting on in age and his family wasn't able to, um, to carry on the business. Um, and therefore we were able to pick it up for uh, a little bit of a discount, um, but then again, it didn't look all that great. So we had to put an awful lot of sweat and tears and money into um, bringing the vineyard up to um, up to its proper production and health. Um, the thing that we learned also is through working with consultants in the early stages. It's not so much that you have a vineyard, but you also have to have the right varietals. You have to have um, the grapes that produce the wines that are friendly to consumers. There's really no point in having um, uh, pearl kassab. Um, you're not going to drink a bottle of pearl kassab, but we had a couple of rows of that on our property. Shasla was another one, a couple of rows of that, but uh, actually there is a winery in Kelowna that um, still makes that, and, and since then we've pulled it out and put some more Pinot Gris on. So we lovingly um, bring our vineyard up to um, up to the right profile and portfolio that we want to have going forward and since then we've done some replantings bought lots of equipment and uh, yeah put a few ages of years on since that picture and my husband looks a lot older than in that picture 
Uh, but we have, we started with 10 barrels and now we have over 400 in the, in the barrel room. Um, and there's me stomping some grapes, Pinot Gris grapes, um, but that was just for show, actually. I didn't really know what the hell I was doing, but it was just a photo op. This last fall, though, I had the wonderful experience of going up to the winemaker and assistant winemaker and asking them if I could have a job. I don't really know what you guys do here. Can I work 10 or eight weeks on a shift with, the, with one of your, your crew shifts um, to learn everything? So, you know, I was like, looked like this every day, but obviously with a lot more red grapes sprayed all over me and uh, cleaning tanks and uh, presses, and I had a ball. So um, thanks to where we've um, arrived, I get to now enjoy some of the other parts of the business that I, up until this point, was not able to do. Um, we have wonderful staff that work, um, you know, throughout the year, obviously. This is typically uh, happens in the spring right now where um, the bottling starts. And then, you know, with the increase of production going from 5,000 to 10,000 to 20,000 to 28,000 cases, every incremental increase meant that we had to replace and increase the size of our equipment. Um, so we'd, you know, sell an old press. This is the third time we've increased the size of our press. Um, coming, and these are presses that come, we have two of these, they're presses that come from Italy. We just bought 10, uh, nine, 10,000 tank, so, liter, 10,000 liter tanks from Italy last fall. And I'm so excited now that we have a catwalk that uh, you walk up above um, to the tops of the tanks and I, there's, there's these little things that <laughs> really excite me. <laughs> and then there's the other side, you know, we're out there trying to uh, be in festivals and uh, have people taste our wines and it's such a treat to be out in the market because um, more often than not people come up and say, I've, I've tried your wine, I've tasted your wine. So, you know, it's so wonderful to hear that every single time. That um, pond that you saw at the beginning, that's what it looks like these days now. Um, we do events around the pool and our landscaping has uh, matured into some lovely rose bushes in, around the area. Um, and we hold events um, uh, for, for weddings and other um, gatherings. Uh, not too many. We still really focus on what we do best and that is making great wine. Um, we also don't have a restaurant, which a lot of other wineries are, are, you know, they like to get into that because it's, why not? I mean, the tourism industry uh, in and around the Okanagan is, is so wonderful, it's so beautiful, and people love to come out and visit. We were um, thrilled a couple of years ago, well, I guess obviously this picture is a little bit older because the um, Governor General at the time, Michelet Jean, was uh, a guest at our winery uh, with her husband. And um, this was an honor. They were selected, uh, we were selected one of four wineries to go to. One of them, of course, being the big Vincor, and they sat down and had a big gala, you know, event with, with fabulous food and wine pairings. And um, we asked her to come to the wine shop. And then, of course, not necessarily to teach her about, you know, how fabulous our wines were. We tried to come up with another idea. We brought in all our growers. We brought in the people of the land, the people in our community, and all of our staff. And you know that was actually so enjoyable for her. She was a real people person. We did a little bit of research on that. And um, having, having just a great group of, of hardworking um, employees and uh, growers was, is all that she, she really wanted. And of course, they, they, uh, you know, they enjoyed their time. 
And of course, the awards come. This is uh, the Lieutenant Governor of BC Award that we won for our Syrah a few years back. Um, the industry, uh, or BC, of course, embraces or encourages um, the BC wine industry and there's a competition every year. Um, a lot of wineries also, there's other wineries that win these awards, but we're always l very honored to to uh, to win them, um, of course. And then, what did we do from there? We decided that, um, we were told, because we didn't do any advertising, because all of our word of mouth, everything went into our labels, that needed, that has a life as well. So initially we thought five years was going to be the length of time that the labels would work for us in recognition for Blasted Church. It, um, time flew and at our eighth year, um, we came up with uh, reinventing the, the labels again and the brand. So um, this time around, this is hard, a little bit difficult to see, but this is uh, Chris Sickles' studio. He works out of um, Indiana. That is where he creates our um, new characters for our labels. These, it's fabulous. We just love this edginess about it. It's all about Blasted Church. Um, and these characters are actually um, built, uh, the clothes are sewn, the little, um, um, all the uh, accessories, all the accents are all handmade um, and just designed to the, spe the specifics that we want for the label, um, starting with the mining camp, as you can see where we want to um, tell the story all over again. So in this series, we actually, uh, incorporate a little, little bit more of the story going all back actually to the mining before the moving of the church. Um, and these elements in, in these uh, labels are, are so much fun to just look through. And we, you, you, of course, the reason why this is done um, in the creative, in our website and, and these images is because Looking at the bottle itself, you just, from that angle, you would just see the lady. So you have to keep on twirling the bottle around to see all the rest of all the things that are going on in the label, because it's a wraparound label. The, another example that I wanted to tell you about again with the big corporation versus the, our, our little um, David, where these labels are almost impossible to put on a bottle in, a, in, a, in our bottling line. Nobody would ever attempt to try to wrap this size of paper around a bottle. The bottles are a glass mold, but they're not, there are some imperfections. So, in making this work for us, and we really make, try to make sure that we have quality control and the bottles look perfect when you, they get out to your table or where you pick them up from the store, is that we buy the most expensive glass you can buy in the world, um, directly from France, so that the molds are perfect, so that we have that quarter inch in the back, which is the only gap that we have, and they go on and are applied smoothly nobody would think of doing such a thing. Although these bottles are um, used by other wineries, they typically, after a mold is, is, is started, there's a lot of knockoffs and you know, people will go out, companies will go out and, and source the, the cheaper or the more economical um, cost to the, the wine bottle. We stick to trying to make something that's unique um, with these pictures, and uh, it's not achieved by any any easy in easy and any easy way. So um, that's why there's a lot of people that work on the bottling line and a lot of quality control to make sure that uh, um, you see these fabulous labels. I was just curious what year it was when you first launched your very first label, just to understand. 2002, 14 years ago. 
How many full-time employees yeah. do we have? Yeah. Um, we have 15 full-time employees. Um, it's very unique for us. It d typically doesn't um, happen for a BC winery, but we have two full-time sales um, managers in, in Vancouver. Um, more, most wineries have agencies that they work with that will have a portfolio of other wineries. That was a choice. It um, all fell into place because we had our son who created our website. We asked him also to uh, create an inventory system for us. And with that, we then um, uh, leased a warehouse. Um, there's a, our branded delivery van that runs around the town. We do everything um, different from most wineries. And we're at the stage that we can, uh, it was four years ago we, when we launched the new label that we did this. It was um, a yeah, conscious decision. Um, it's unusual, nobody would do that because with an uh, agency you'll typically um, uh, pay um, um, a commission.